welcome to the podcast of Leeds First Methodist Church. We are so glad you decided to tune in with us today. The following sermon was preached by Pastor Chris, and it is the second sermon in our church's Facing the Challenge series. If you would like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so by visiting our website at leadsfirst.org, and at the top of the page, go to Worship and click Online Worship. Hey, you may be seated if you'd like. You are singing so well. It's good to be with you today. My name is Chris Stallings. It is my privilege to pastor here at Leeds First Methodist Church. We're in the second Sunday of our series, Facing the Challenge. In life, when you put your faith in Jesus, it's true. There are infinite rewards. Anybody say Amen. Nobody believes that. Amen? Amen. There's infinite rewards, but there are also real challenges and suffering in this life. Some of you may say amen to that, right? And so this series is to help guide us through facing those challenges as a follower of Jesus, how we might even see contentment in the face of those challenges. We've got a series, key verses this month from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And they read, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me Strength. Today we continue in part two, facing the challenge of death. Facing the challenge of death. Well, some of you know I grew up in rural North Alabama in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I think I said that right. Appalachian. I don't know. Some of you, anyway. You may know that region is low income, and like other low income areas, the folks there, including myself, began life or inherited a kind of gift of pessimism, even a kind of defeatist attitude in much of life. It carried over into many aspects. I remember there were times when even our sports teams had a winning season and made the playoffs. There was a kind of pessimistic attitude from even the folks that went to the playoff games, murmuring under their breath, we'll probably get knocked out in the first round. Some of those cases were true. Of course, you don't win every game. And the facts were true. Incomes were below the national median income level and even below the state median income level and even our high school graduating classes maybe only 10 or 15 percent had thoughts of going on to college it propagated i remember my fresh after my freshman year of college at auburn i came home over the summer and we were going to get haircuts there wasn't a barber and a beauty parlor there was a place One lady cut everybody, the men and women, the boys and the girls, the kids and all. So I went in and was going to get a haircut, and one of my high school teachers was there. Struck up a little conversation. So what you doing? I said, oh, I, I went to Auburn to college. And her first comment was, are you home because you flunked out? And some of you that know me are thinking, well, she had reason to know. And it wasn't just a comment directed at me. Many of the folks that did go on to school didn't make it through. And so there was this kind of pessimistic or defeated attitude. Our life can sometimes be like that when we face the challenges of life. And they come sometimes like Does anybody feel like they're in a parade of challenges? Maybe even right now, right? It's just one and then the next and the next. And when we face that, and when we know the truth of the end of this life, it ends in death. Sometimes our hope may even dry up. Maybe we even fear death. There was a study by a 
university called Chapman University asked a thousand people what they feared most. And they do it year after year. And I think the most recent was 23. And in the top 10, nestled right in the middle, number five was fear of dying. You might, you know, so what's number one, right? Number one fear is the fear of a corrupt government. You, it's because we're brainwashed, right? We hear all the news and so forth. The number two fear was of an economic collapse. People fear that more than dying, right? But an interesting twist, when I read a little bit further in the study, that number five fear of dying was not fear of the person's own death, but fear of somebody they loved dying. Their own death, fear of that was way down the list outside the top ten. And that fear of other people dying might be a, a sign of the care or empathy we have for others. Right? I care more about them than I do myself. It could be a sign of the fear of grief in our own life. Like we don't want to face what it means to lose somebody that we love. It may be also a sign in the general population of a, a kind of apathy or a ignorance of the eternal consequences of death. Ignorance is bliss, they say sometimes. At some point in your life, in my life, in our lives, we probably didn't know death existed. Right? And then there was a time whenever we realized there is such a thing as dying. Maybe as a child, we were like oblivious to it. Maybe even as a young person, we lived in such a way like Nothing can ever happen to me. Anybody ever drive like that? I did. And then we have a brush maybe even with our own mortality and there's a car wreck or an illness or maybe even someone we love or close to encounters that. And it hits us, right? There's a reality that we are going to die. And so in that moment, we kind of have to wrestle with, is it going to be our number one fear? Maybe even in your life, there was a time when you realized this death as it might come is waiting. And it might have even consumed you. I remember when I was a kid and I realized that was true. It was waiting. So we might be consumed by that. We might ignore that. Or we might look to scripture and see how we face the challenge of living <clears throat> knowing the truth that we are all dying. So today we're going to look at a scripture from the passage or from the book of 2 Corinthians and see what the Bible says about that kind of challenge. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you want to begin, open your Bible to that. <coughs> 2 Corinthians was a, uh, originally a letter written in the first century of the um, first century in the New Testament church where the Apostle Paul was writing to a church in the town of Corinth, Greece. Paul had visited there. He had written them previously at least one other time, probably multiple times. We have a previous letter written that's recorded as 1 Corinthians. And in that letter, Paul kind of laid down the the pastoral smackdown a little bit. It's like, y'all getting this wrong? You're doing this wrong? You're good night. What are you doing? Right? So fix these things. And I don't know if he hesitated to go back, but somehow word got back to him that they had done those steps and had followed his pastoral leadership. And then, so this letter, 2 Corinthians, has a, a tone of a kind of restored relationship. But it also has a theme where folks are encountering suffering and Paul is saying, hey, I've been there with you. Maybe not personally together in the same circumstance, but in suffering. And I want to tell you a little bit about what God has done to get me through and how it might be helpful to you as you face struggle, as you face hardship, as you face persecution, even the future of death. So let's look now at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. Second Corinthians, chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. I'm reading the New Living Translation, if you want to follow along word for word in your Bible, your app, or the word should also be on the screen. 
2 Corinthians 4, 13. <clears throat> but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of, kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. As God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. Verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Verse 18. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven. An eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. For this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let me start off just by saying this is not a sermon about how to endure grief in loss or death. Although grief is a huge part of our life. Just know that whenever you encounter loss or death, grief is a means by which God helps you to journey through that. Those are not fun paths, but it is part of God's design for you. In fact, if you look at John, let's see where this is, John chapter 11, verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Y'all know that? The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35. 35. Some of y'all are like, I memorized that one in news. <laughs> that was fun. But it was in the circumstance where they said Lazarus had died and Jesus, his friend, learned of that. And Jesus in his earthly human ministry was like, my heart's broken. And Jesus wept. And so you're right to grieve in experiencing loss. But that's not our primary topic today. This is also not a sermon to help appease you in life if you're not following God. Right? If you're not trusting in Jesus, I'm not saying it's going to turn out good for you. In fact, this is a sermon about your need for salvation. And that once you experience that by repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus and you're following Jesus, your number one purpose in life is to reach others with the good news of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's the number one purpose in your life. And so it'll challenge you today if you think, I don't need God, I don't worry about death or its consequences. The invitation for you is to experience salvation. And if you have experienced that and you're following Jesus and there's any other purpose in your life than to see other people know Jesus, I'm going to invite you to consider moving that down the list and make this your number one purpose. Even within the church, there are multiple functions. We say our mission is to make paths for more people to worship, grow, serve, and reach to know and grow like Jesus, right? And those paths, worship, grow and serve, those are ones, if you don't know this, we'll get to continue on in eternity, more heaven. But reaching other people is the only thing that has a, a time window, a fixed time window, only while we're here. Right? And so we're going to worship, we're going to serve, we're going to grow, but our priority, the only thing we can do in this life that we can't do in eternity is reach other people because once we're in heaven, there's nothing we can do to reach other people. Invite them there. Hebrews 9, 27 to 28 says, 
And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. So the key takeaway from this passage in 2 Corinthians is from verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirit is being renewed every day. Our purpose is to share that news with others. It's true. How many of you want to admit you're getting older? A few of y'all? Nudge the next person to you and make sure they're awake. We're all getting older, right? If you didn't raise your hand, then, mm, 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 I can hear talking. Right? Pay attention. Right? You don't have to. You can sleep through this. That's fine. If you snore, I'm going to nudge you, okay? But we're getting older. It's true. We're getting older. It's true. We're facing the reality of death. But the gospel of Jesus is your fuel to not lose hope in this life. It's the gospel of Jesus that is the priority for your life and your impact on others. You see, if, if God only cared about saving you, the moment you prayed the prayer to repent and believe, God would have said, there they are, they're done. Just get them to heaven, come on. Right? Or the moment you walk through the confirmation line as a teenager, I believe, boom. Right? Or the moment you knelt and prayed the sinner's prayer or asked God to save your soul and repented and believed, stood up from the altar, God said, okay, I'm good, come on. But God has a purpose for you to be a part of his plan of sharing that with other people. So if you've got breath, you've got that purpose. If you've got a heartbeat, you've got that purpose. If you've got faith in Jesus, you've got that purpose. And so no matter what the outlook looks like in your life, if you're running the gauntlet, so to speak, of challenges right now, God said, I still got that purpose for you. Right? And if you'll cling to that purpose, you can ignore, I know that's hard to say, but you can be content, maybe is a better way to say it, with the reality of what is coming tomorrow or ultimately at the end of this life. No, you are made for God's purpose beyond yourself and giving others to heaven is tops on that list. Let's look now at this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, how we might know and apply some key takeaways to face the challenge of death. We've got your worship bulletin. It's a place for you to follow along with these. You can take notes, fill in the blank if that's helpful to you. Sometimes I give prizes to those who do that. I don't have my stars with me today. Just know it's for God's glory. Number one, face the challenge of death. Follow Jesus into resurrection. Follow Jesus into resurrection. Verse 14 reads, We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. <coughs> some of you may be keenly aware, some of you may be like, oh, what was that? But this week, the United States and its NATO allies recognized or remembered the 80th anniversary of D-Day. D-Day was the, the day, June 6, 1944, where Allied troops landed on the beaches of Normandy and through awfulness took the beach made their way inland and took from the enemy the Nazi enemy who were occupying France liberty beginning of the turning point of the World War II I admit my knowledge of combat or even serving in the military is from history books from movies from those that have shared the story, but they say it's hard to follow somebody on the ground that isn't in the trenches with you. You know what I mean? 
Like if you had the sergeant or lieutenant that says, all right, y'all go get that beach and take that enemy territory and come back and get me whenever it's safe. You know, like if the sergeant did that, <clears throat> now they give the orders and people got to go and do, but if they weren't together in it, you'd be like, you know, where are you at? You know, as, as commands get bigger and bigger, the, the generals and so forth can't be there and all. But those that are leading the troops go with the troops, right? It's hard to follow somebody that wants to lead from the back, right? And Jesus, if you look at his life, his earthly ministry, he modeled leading from the front. You know what I mean? Like he said, hey, y'all follow me and I'm going to, and he went, right? He led how to love people. He led in how to show compassion to people, even sinners. He led in sacrifice. He even led by facing death and he led almighty God's power in him in resurrection. And the truth of this verse is that that's the power that God gives you. Jesus modeled leading from the front and belief in his resurrection is all the power you need to be able to believe and to speak the truth of Jesus, to even face death like Jesus, and even to follow Jesus in resurrection. You see, Jesus wrote the check and cast it for your benefit. Therefore, you have assurance that following Jesus in this life in every way will lead you to following Jesus in resurrection in your death. When you put your faith in Jesus, you get to claim you're no longer doomed. You have the hope of resurrection. Follow Jesus into resurrection. Number two, face the challenge of death. Amplify grace for God's glory. Amplify grace for God's glory. Verse 15 reads, all of this, all of life, all the headaches, all the ministry we do, all of this is for your benefit. As God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. The resurrection of Jesus gives you the power to defeat sin, to defeat sin, to defeat sin. The power to defeat eternal consequences of sin. The power to speak. As Paul quotes the psalmist is speaking, when you believe, you speak the name of Jesus. But his purpose is for the benefit of others. You speak for the sake of others. And because of that, how you speak matters. Not only to speak the name of Jesus, speak the truth of the gospel, but how you speak to other people matters in that truth and in all of how you speak. You speak so that the good news of Jesus will reach other people so that they will become worshipers of Jesus and they will then become part of amplifying the grace of God to other people. Do y'all remember this game? I don't know if it's still played at youth parties or whatever used to play this game called telephone. Y'all remember that? You'd line up the, around the edge of the room, sitting in chairs or standing, and one person would have a written statement, and they would read it, and they would whisper it into the ear of the person next to them. Y'all remember this? Anybody? Y'all know what I'm talking about? All right, so I'm not just... All right, so you would whisper it, start it, and then they would whisper it, what they heard, into the next person, and then they would... Whisper it to the next person. Nobody could hear what each one was whispering, but you heard what they said, and you passed it on. And 10 or 15 or 20 people around the room, and when it got to the other end of the circle, the person that was last would recite back to the group what they had heard. Did anybody participate in that where they got it exactly right? Oh, you smart, Alex. You did not. <laughs> But it's just you and your best friend, right? If you went around the room, it got messed up. You didn't hear it right, or somebody's like, use a different word, and it get changed and changed and changed. And you'd read back what the first thing said, and they'd be talking about World War II, and you'd be talking about like 
who you're going to prom with, right? It's just totally different. It gets changed. The temptation the devil lays before us is to play like that with the gospel. Like, well, I think I got it, and then add some to it, and then, and then kind of get it flipped upside down and put our own self in that and say stuff like, oh, the gospel is for the people I like. The gospel is for this if you, you know, vote the way I do or, you know, this kind of stuff. And we add on to that and instead of being amplifiers of the gospel, we become multipliers of the gossip or the slander or the harm we speak to other people. Today's culture is riddled with criticism, with gossip, with slander, of add on to instead of focusing on. And the sum, Christians are jumping all in. Woo, let, me, let me be the next one to pass on or forward or post this slanderous thing. Here's the trouble. When you talk about people and you're a representative of the gospel instead of talking with people about Jesus you delay instead of amplifying the gospel and I need some of you to hear this and know to stop right you need to stop thinking I can just talk bad about anybody I want to because you're hurting the gospel if you're saying I put my faith in Jesus and I'm helping amplify that grace to other people you need to Quit being a gossip. Quit slandering other people. Quit being a critic of everybody. And go talk to people. Build a relationship with people. Because it's important. The gospel is important. There are eternal consequences. People without Jesus, when they die, they go to hell. They can't get any bigger than that. And when the church, or when Christians, go all in with the slander and the gossip and the Instead of the gospel, all people, hell wins another soul. So amplify grace for God's glory. Number three, glance at trouble, but gaze at glory. Glance at trouble, gaze at glory. I don't know if those are glance or something. I just... I take a look at the gaze is what I fix my eyes on. All right, verse 18 says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. We are to keep our gaze on glory. God Almighty, because the things of this world are temporary and the things of God are eternal. If you put up the, the scales, the balance scales, and you put the troubles of this world, they're going to weigh down. But when you put God's glory and all eternity on the other, it doesn't just tip the scales, it obliterates them. Is that the right word? Obliterates them? Right? Eternity is literally forever. And so temporary troubles don't tip the scale at all when we weigh all of eternity. Glance at trouble, but keep your gaze on glory. The trouble is, this pushes against our temptation for instant gratification. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean? Like, I want it and I want it now. We love it when we go to the car dealer and they say, sign and drive, no payments for 90 days. You're like, woo -hoo! You know? And in 90 days, you've got all the payments. Furniture stores used to do that. Interest-free for a year. And then you're buying a couch after, uh, anyway. We love the mortgage company that'll finance our home 100%, no money down. Guys used to love to date. And there was a girl that said, we don't need to wait. And the kids love going to grandma's or grandpa's. We serve dessert first before dinner, right? We're just tempted to love instant gratification. But the truth of this scripture and God's truth is that we're designed to thrive when we delay gratification. Britannica defines delayed gratification as the act of resisting an impulse to take an immediate reward in the hope of 
obtaining a more valuable reward in the future. Studies have shown that delayed gratification is essential to our self-regulation. In fact, when they study kids that can do the delayed gratification in like a test environment, when they study how they go on in school, they have better behavior, they have better school outcomes. When they study adolescents who are better in the test of delayed gratification, they find they go on to have higher grades, show less problem behavior in school, or less likely to use cigarettes, alcohol, or other drugs. We're designed by God to delay gratification. That means delaying when there's an impulse to, ooh, that looks really good, let me take that thing that I know I'm not supposed to. But it also means to, in the midst of the the conflict and the, the struggles of life, to not give up hope, but to know there's a good future. To delay gratification, we must avoid the emotional response in the circumstance and attend to the truth or the intellectual or the promises of God in those circumstances. This is true when you're tempted with pleasure. This is true when you're tempted to give up hope in the middle of suffering. Even when you contemplate reality of death. You've heard it. Some people say when you face a, an emotional encounter or a conflict, count to ten. Anybody ever tried that? How many can get past three? Any other? It's hard, right? But there's something to that. That's what this is saying. Right? We need to meter our emotions in the midst of the conflict, the crisis, the suffering, and get to the point where we encounter the truth of God. And in that truth, to move from the hot emotional response to the cool promises of God response, we can be about God and His promises for our future. Some folks have said, just count to ten when it comes to our faith and our life and the promises of God. We might need to be willing to count to ten or a hundred or to eternity to maintain God's purpose promises in our life. Glance at trouble, but gaze at glory. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your presence with us. When we do face suffering, when we do face death and grief, God, give us a clear understanding of our mortality but even more so, give us a clear understanding of salvation through faith in Jesus. That we may know and experience faith. We may know and experience the promise of eternal life. And God, in the midst of the struggles of life, we may see the future, the promise that you've made. We don't get weighed down. But those ever present suffering trials even in Thanks for listening to our podcast. We would love for you to visit us in person at 8:45 a.m. for modern worship or at 11 a.m. for traditional worship. If you would like to plan a visit, simply text the word CONNECT to the number 205-772-4906, and you'll be sent a link to get you started. Thanks again, and God bless.